Hey guys, welcome to uh, Creaky Gamers Historical Channel again and I'm going to be teaching myself the latest version of uh, Brigade Fire and Fury. So I've set up the Battlefield a scenario that you can download from the Fire and Fury website which is uh, the Battle of Mansfield and I've set the map up as close as I can get and I've simplified the scenario a bit so I'll explain that as I go along. So there's the map from the scenario, and as you can see, uh, the victory conditions will be the Union uh, will have suffer heavy losses at 10 stands lost, and the Confederates will suffer heavy losses at 15 stands lost. And the objective is to capture Honeycutt Hill, which is up on that till there. So the Union are on the defence. You read the scenario, they've um, come down the road here in pursuit of the Confederate Army and they've come up on Honeycutt Hill and then found that the Confederates had turned around and ready to attack them. It's basically what's going on. So I'll go over the armies and uh, look at the deployment and then we'll go through the rules briefly and then we'll start Turn 1. Overview of the opposing forces. So I'm down on this... Um, right hand flank of the uh, Confederates which is here there we are so I'm down at this point here down on the map there and we've got uh, B's cavalry which are way out of command because um, Green their commander is way over on the left flank so I brought those on they're meant to be dismounted coming on at an angle but they're on the table everything I've deployed on the table I'll explain as I go uh, then we've got uh, I think it's um, Randall and uh, Wall and Scurry are deployed over here as well on this right flank. And as we go across, Mouton's uh, division is in the middle. They're the ones that are going to be doing the main attack. So they're up on the uh, main attack towards the hill. Uh, these two batteries that I have here, which is Daniel and McMahon, these guys are meant to be deployed off the table. But uh, I'm putting them on the table on this hill. So same thing. They're just going to be, they've got a good uh, view across the table there. So they can uh, fire upon the Union positions. The Confederate commander is Taylor. There he is there. And there's a battery attached in there as well. There's some dismounted cavalry over there. This is on the left flank. Uh, Vincent, they're commanded by Green. Uh, they've got a battery deployed there as well, and I've left these cavalry mounted just for fun. So that's the rest of uh, Green's command is over there. Uh, have a look at the Union deployment. Uh, they're commanded by Ransom, who is the um, Corps commander, but you also have another Corps commander, Franklin. So they'll both operate as Corps commanders, and so, uh, that's going to work out because Banks is not here. So Ransom's the main commander, and Franklin's got there's two divisions here. I'm just going to count them all as a single division for losses, just to keep it simple for the scenario, so I don't have to think of too many different things. And so we've got um, Dudley's dismounted cavalry. I didn't have quite enough dismounted cavalry stands there, but they've deployed up on Honeycutt Hill uh, in a refused flank formation. We've got Emerson and some more artillery and then Vance his brigade is here these guys are all experienced and some more dismounted cavalry which is uh, Lucas rifled carbines and you can see by the if you haven't played fire and fury before I'll just go over the stats here so for example Vance uh, they're experienced and they're 864 so it means they're fresh when they've got eight stands when they drop down to six they'll be uh, worn and when they drop down to four they'll be spent so that's just the morale level as they take uh, base losses and they'll lose you know, bases from shooting and from uh, combat but more on that later on and then coming on the table here as well there's a couple of batteries which are you know, there's a bit of a log jam on the road and I think it's Cameron's division here. A couple of small brigades as well are coming on. So that's the Union position. And they've got a hold Honeycutt Hill. They've got some uh, plenty of artillery. They've got the troops to be able to hold. 
I think they don't have any veteran units I can't see they're all experienced they've got some veteran artillery but um, they're uh, up against it I think we'll find out we'll see how the scenario plays out yeah, so looking at the scenario again, because I'm uh, playing both sides, I need to sort of uh, keep things honest. So the Confederates' orders will be are, is to attack. So the Confederates will be attacking, and the Union, well, they will be defending and just trying to hold this hill. Whereas if I was playing the Union, I'd probably do something silly and counterattack or whatever. So I'll try and play to those orders. So the Union's orders are to hold until reinforcements are going to come down the road and the confederates orders will be to attack so the main attack is from mouton's division and then these guys over here will kind of try and sweep around this flank and these cavalry are going to try and put pressure on here meanwhile the artillery will be bombarding the union positions okay so that's the plan before i go any further we should talk about the uh terrain and if you look at all these fields and so on, are pretty much open ground around here. There are some woods, so some here, some woods there, some woods up there and here and so on. So woods will give you a uh, cover bonus and they count as rough ground and two inch visibility and so on. There's an orchard here, looks nice and neat at the moment. Once I get some troops in there, all those trees will get knocked over. But the orchard just affects movement, doesn't affect line of sight or cover or anything. So there's an orchard. Uh, there is a dry stream. There's maybe another one over there somewhere. So the, the stream is a dry stream. Um, and it just affects movement, counts as rough ground. And, of course, the road's a road. So that's the terrain. That's the orders for the armies. Okay, so, so if you haven't uh, played Fire and Fury before, or your coming back to Fire and Fury after a long break. Um, so I'm up to the second edition, which came out oh, a few years ago now, but uh, I've been in and out of uh, American Civil War gaming. I've, my collection's about 20 odd years old and I get it out occasionally and I've played lots of different rule sets. So I thought I'd give um, Brigade Fire and Fury a go again. Uh, one of the main reasons, things I like about it is that um, everything's resolved with a, a single D10. So that's uh, better than throwing handfuls of dice and so on. And we'll go through the turn sequence. That's probably the best way to explain the game. So the turn sequence, it's got three main phases. Basically, you're going to be moving everything around. In the maneuver phase where you replace your fallen leaders and then maneuver all your brigades and then move your detached leaders it's simply as uh, simple as that uh, and then the shooting phase and the good thing about fire and fury is that the defending side the guys whose turn it isn't so in this case in this scenario the confederates will be going first so they'll move up the union will be able to do their defensive fire And uh, then the Confederates will do their offensive fire. So the shooting phase has got two stages. And then the charge phase, which is the final phase. Any units that were charged into combat. From the bad end, and when you charge, you like furies. You resolve the combat and the combat phase is an opposed dice roll so you both roll a d10 and you compare your numbers and with your bonuses and so on so that's it so the the three phases i mean say the fire phase has got two stages and then there's little steps in each stage like any rules okay well let's get cracking turn one so it'll be the maneuver phase At the uh, start of the maneuver phase, the first thing you need to do is attach and detach your leaders and so on. And there is risk with that. If you attach your leader, you're going to get some bonuses to your brigade. So, for example, here I've got uh, Walker in front of me. He's got three brigades under his command. And they're all in command range at the moment, which is 12 inches. It gets reduced for uh, terrain and so on. I'll have a look at the factors in a minute. 
but um, if you attach a leader, uh, then when they're shooting at you and so on, things could uh, things could go wrong. So um, you don't want to attach your leaders unnecessarily because if they get shot at and the shooting guy rolls a 10, then there's a chance that something's going to happen to your leader. There's risk and reward to it. Okay, so more on that later on. Um, so let's get on with uh, the manoeuvre phase. And so what I'll do is during the first uh, turn or so, I'll, well, let's say this during the first turn, I'll go through the factors and you can pick me up on any mistakes I make and just explain the rules to myself and to anybody uh, new to the rules. That's the plan anyway. Okay, so I'm going to manoeuvre these guys down here. So I've got uh, Walker is the commander. You can't see he's a bit shiny there, but Walker's the commander. And these guys, they're all within uh, command range. There's no terrain that they're, they've got line of sight to him. And he's got a 12-inch command range unless it's going through the woods or something. So his three brigades are in his command. Now, he's not an exceptional commander or anything like that. So we have a look at the uh, factors that we have here. Um, bring this arrow over here, I can point out. All right, so a commander within 12-inch command radius of each detached core divisional commander, so they're getting a plus one to their manoeuvre roll. And they're rolling on this table over here. They're in good order, so we'll get a result on this table. Pretty much if they're fresh, and in this case, I'm going to do the front unit their experience so there's no no uh negatives for being green or anything so just no modifiers there but they're fresh and they're in command so they're getting a plus three their formation could make a difference as well and then as the battle goes on if they've lost a key position or they've lost heavy casualties then uh, things could get worse for them so if i roll a dice and so the confederate dice will be the butternut dice this one the gold one so I've rolled a one. Well, that's that's not a very good start, boys. All right. So they've got a one. Um, so they're one, but they're getting plus three. So that's on a four. And so if they're in good order, and I've rolled a four, then they've uh, well handled. They may perform one maneuver as they are moving. All right. So I'm just going to move up, and there are uh, templates to help you with. Um, Maneuvering, telling you you can wheel up to 45 degrees. So if I wanted this unit to turn 90 degrees, it would take me two turns to actually wheel them around 90 degrees. And they can also oblique as they move forward. So there's another template, so they can oblique up to 45 degrees. So there's a bit of flexibility, but a few restrictions. So it's not just um, like some other rules where you just pick up units and move them wherever you like. Um, there's a bit more restrictive and you've got to plan ahead. So that's one of the good things about Fire and Fury. Now the movement rate, in open ground, they're in line, they would move 12 inches, but they're on broken ground because they're crossing that little stream in front of them. So they're just going to be moving forward and they can move up to 8 inches over broken ground just for the normal move. They've got uh, mixed musketry. So they've got an eight, I think about an eight inch range, and they're going to be moving eight inches forward. And I could move them up and I could oblique 45 degrees. So I'm just moving them straight ahead. Let's get up there and get stuck into them. That stream slowed them down a little bit. But uh, there's our first maneuver, and they're heading towards the uh, union positions you can see there through the through the orchard. They'll probably have to go through the orchard. The orchard will slow them down as well. So then I would roll for the next brigade. And again, they're all um, in, um, they're all experienced and they're all in good order and so on. So the next brigade, the one behind them, I'm just going to move them up behind. The guy's in line there. And, uh, they've rolled a three, so they're okay. And they're not going to get any extra movement or anything. So they're just going to get across the stream as well. And they're going to move up in support. I'm going to oblique a bit. Take a little bit of movement off there. Depending on how pedantic things you want to get for the movement. But as you get closer, you may want to you know, be a bit more careful. But at this distance, when you're so far away, it's not going to make much difference. Not in my It depends how tight you want to play your actual movement and so on. 
next brigade here, which is in a uh, column, a field column. So the field column actually gives them an extra plus one, but I'm going to move them out into line. It's going to take all their movement. So we're getting plus one for our field column or in linear cover. So I'm actually getting a plus four. And so they're up to eight. So they're well handled. They can perform one maneuver. And it takes you your whole move to form line. So they're going to form line out here. You can pick one stand as the reference and go either direction. Actually, I might go a little bit more that way. So there. They've deployed out into line. And so that's the... Uh, oops, I missed a stand here. Where's that from? There, yes. Okay, and that's... Um, that's the manoeuvring of uh, Walker's division. Now, next thing I've got these cavalry neck behind them here. I've got these cavalry. And my plan is for those cavalry to scoot up the flank. So roll for the cavalry. They're fresh and they're veteran. So that gives me a couple of pluses, I think. Veteran plus and they're fresh. So they're plus three. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. So ten or more, they can move at the double quick. So they can move a little bit faster. There's a little bit bonus to rolling high and being in good order and so on. They can move at the double quick. But there's too many guys in front of them. So what I'm just going to do, just for now, I'm just going to wheel them a bit and move them up behind there. Keep them safe for now. I don't want to throw away all my cavalry before at the start of the battle, like I would normally. Okay, so that's that. That flank is moved. At the end of the phase, I would move uh, Walker up, the commander. Okay, so just to reiterate, uh, Walker has done his job. There's Walker. And you can see he has sent his brigades forward. Two have moved up in line, and these guys have deployed into line. And that is where they are. They're on the right flank here on the map, and they're following the, their orders to attack. And B's cavalry has moved up behind them. Okay, so let's move over on to Mouton. Okay, so looking okay. in the uh, centre of the battlefield, and we've got uh, Mouton's division, and he's got uh, two brigades here, and I had to look up the pronunciation. You can see uh, he is actually here. This guy here is a, an exceptional brigade commander, and his name is Polignac, which is French. So I had to look up how to pronounce that. Polignac, my French isn't very good. Uh, so he's an exceptional brigade commander, so he'll get a bonus to the maneuver roll. And Gray is, uh, they're both um, veteran units. So we have a couple of veteran units, which will give us a bonus as well. Uh, and they're all in command range of Taylor. So we'll uh, maneuver these guys forward. Now I have to be careful because they do have an attached battery here. And the attached battery, I don't want to mask those guns. So I need to make sure I leave a one inch wide gap either side of that. So I may slightly oblique with those units as I move them up. Okay, so uh, there we have Mouton, who is the commander of this division. He's got these uh, Polynux Brigade in uh, command range. And Polynux himself is an exceptional brigade commander. So, And they've also got uh, the... Core Commander Taylor in range as well. So you get plus one, two, Veteran three, Exceptional Brigade Commander four, and they're fresh. They're getting a plus six. So unless we roll really bad, and I've rolled a ten, so they're okay to move up. So they can move with, um, what is it, a quick move. Yeah, uh, may perform one maneuver at the double quick rate. Okay. Okay, so now I'm not going to think, do I really want to move them up the uh, the 16 inches for double quick, which would put them up into musket range of uh, all that firepower on the hill there. So I think they're just going to move up in support of uh, Walker's division and stay out of the way of their own guns. You need a one inch wide gap to fire your gun. So this gun here still should be able to fire up straight up on the hill and miss their, their mates. All right, so they've moved forward. Um, and then we've got the next uh, 
Brigade, which is Gray's Brigade. They are veteran as well. A couple of commanders in range. I'll throw the dice into the box. And they've got a six. So they are move, can move at the double quick as well. And they've got artillery over there. They don't want to mask the artillery. So they're just going to move up. Let's keep the lines nice and neat for now. And not get in the way of their own artillery. So they'll move up as well. All right, so this gun, and it's got a big three in front of them, can still shoot through there. They've stayed out of their uh, musket range for now. Uh, but they're following their orders. They are moving up and attacking. But we want to try and soften them up a little bit with our artillery first. Okay, then uh, out on this flank, I've got uh, Green's Cavalry. And it looks like they're all veterans. And um, there's a bit of firepower sitting across from them on that hill. So... I've got one unit dismounted already, and it probably be wise just to dismount the other cavalry. I do have grand designs of, well, normally I would probably charge the cavalry in and see what happens, but um, I'm going to uh, play, uh, play it a bit smarter and uh, dismount my cavalry and just hang back until we see what the, the main attack from Mouton's uh, division is going to do. So I'll roll for them and... Uh, dismount them all I think and just leave them in position for now no point in throwing them away okay, so first of all I've got Bagby's uh, brigade here six stands so I'm going to dismount them so I'll lose a stand as a horse holder so I'll have five stands left they're in command they're veteran and they're fresh so they're getting a plus one for being in command uh, veteran plus two fresh so they're getting plus four plus four and I've rolled a two just going to Fudge it a little bit there. Okay, so they've just mounted in the woods there and they're ready to help the attack. I'm going to leave the other guys where they are for now. And so I think that's the end of the uh, the maneuver phase. So at the end of the maneuver phase, the next thing to do is to have a put the turn sequence up there just so you can see what I'm talking about. So maneuvered brigades and everything, so everything's done. Um, I didn't declare any charges, um, no cavalry you know, counter charges. So I'm just going to move the detached leaders just so I've got them all in command range ready for next turn. So move all the commanders and the commanders uh, move around pretty quickly on horseback. And what do they say? Leaders move 24, 20 over broken ground. So they've got plenty of movement. I'm just going to move, Walker's going to move up, so he's got all of his uh, division in command. Utah will move up as well. Taylor will move up to support the main attack and keep as many of those guys on the left flank. And uh, Green will also move up and keep everybody in command range as well. And that's it. That's the end of the manoeuvre phase. Okay, so shooting phase so the defensive fire now the uh confederates have cunningly stayed out of uh, musket range which is eight inches so eight inches in all those directions around there i'll leave that eight inch template there so you can see the range of musketry but they do have uh two artillery pieces up on the hill here which are unlimbered and ready to fire so i'll do this one here first so I'll leave that there so you can see. Now they have a, um, a 15 degree uh, arc of fire. And so conveniently available from the um, Fire and Fury website or in the back of the book, there's a template like this. I know it's a bit shiny under these lights, but there's the 15 degree arc out that way. So basically, I'm just going to, this one's just going to fire directly ahead at uh who is it walls brigade uh, in front of them and the range i'll measure the range the range to walls brigade is or well, they're about 14 inches away so if we look on the table here we work out how many fire points they're going to get to add and it is a rifle and napoleon gun i think just check what it is uh that one is no it's a napoleon 
artillery piece there it is there all right so up to that range it's going to be it's 14 inches so it's in that range being four fire points so if they had any other uh, musketry fire or more cannons firing they would add more fire points and you work out how many fire points that you have so they've got four fire points so unfortunately it's not enough to give them a bonus and it's going to be a minus one and then there might be other modifiers uh, green battery firing inflate or march column or so on but there's no there's no cover uh, they didn't change formation or anything they're not inflated nothing else there so it's just going to be at a minus one so they'll roll the dice at a minus one the target are experienced so they'll be looking on this table here experienced I don't think there's any pluses uh, battery limbered no i can't think of any any other pluses or minuses on this table here um sure you'll tell me if i've got one wrong and so we'll roll the dice and see what they get so the union i've got a blue dice and so they've rolled a seven so a seven minus one takes it down to six and their experience galling fire the brigade is disordered lose one troop stand if already disordered or broken so they're disordered or if it was a battery they would be um silenced so I put a little disorder mark. There we go. So they are disordered. Wall's brigade was disordered from the artillery. So that's them. I'll just check out the other gun. The other gun is a rifled Napoleon, I think. Oh, I like to put some smoke on there so that they know they fired. And the other one's going to shoot in the other direction. Put some smoke on them while I'm here. That's the Napoleon. It's going to shoot. Uh, it was probably in arc. It could shoot at that deployed artillery. Let's shoot at the deployed artillery and we'll see what that does. It's a bit of counter battery fire. And that's rifled Napoleon. Rifled Napoleon. It's 18 inches away. Just over 18 inches. Or it could shoot at the uh or the cavalry dismounted, so you might get it. That's a change formation. Now shoot at the artillery just over 18 inches away. So let's have a look at it. Rival Napoleon, just over 18, so it's going to be three fire points. It's just over 18 inches. They didn't, didn't deploy close enough for it to shoot them. So it's going to get three fire points. Um, battery's not limbered, but so it's going to be a minus one, I think. But, uh, battery's limbered, no. Partial cover or dismounted cavalry, no. Just at minus three. There's nothing there. All right, so, uh, sorry, minus one. For three fire points, it's minus two. Oh, dear. So it's going to be minus two, only three fire points. Let me know if I've got this wrong. Three fire points. So that gives them a minus two. I can't see anything else on the table. Minus two. Four becomes a two. And the target is veteran. No, the, the yeah, veteran. That's horse and horse veteran horse artillery. So nothing. Not going to do anything. Just sultry fire. No effect. Charge home. So they fired as well. So unfortunately for the Union, nothing else to, to shoot. The other artillery is uh, coming up the road. It's limbered. And they've got these guns on the hill. So that's the end of the defensive fire phase. Okay, so looking at all the artillery, let's go through them individually and the range and so on. So this um, smoothbore gun is within 18 inches. That's the horse artillery. So I'll smoke them up there and add up their fire points. So at uh, 18 inches, the smoothbore will add three fire points. All right, so one, two, three from him. Uh, this gun down here, which is the Napoleon within 18 inches. So the Napoleon within 18 inches will add four fire points. One, two, three, four. And then back here, and I'll just put a smoke on that so I remember I've added his fire points. And then I've got these two back here, which are the same guns, both uh, 
uh, rifled smoothbore here, rifle and smoothbore here, and they are at 28 inches, I think. Well over 18. What is it? It's about, yeah, about 27, 28 inches. So it's in this range being here. So they're going to add another two inch. So one, two, one, two. So I'm using my clicker to remind me of how many. It's like a golf uh, clicker. And I'm up to 11. So that's 11 fire points. So look on the table here. 11 gives me a plus one. There's no other pluses or minuses here for the target being enfiladed or a column or anything like that. So I'm just going to be rolling a dice at a plus one. And I rolled a three. Oh, three plus one is four. Well, that's disappointing, boys. So a four and the target. Oh, I can't remember what they were. They're experienced. So a four against an experienced unit. Lively fire. They're disordered. Um, no effective, only musketry. From cannon, yeah, from cannon. So it was cannon shooting and a brigade disorder, uh, brigade disorder, lively fire. No effective, only musket. Well, that's not too bad. But anyway, so we'll put a little disorder marker on them. And they didn't lose any stands or anything. Nobody's lost any stands, so there's no, uh, no victory point accumulation happening. And that's the end of the shooting phase. On the bad end. And when you charge, you like your ass. Okay, well, unfortunately, there's nothing to do in the charge phase. So our first turn is uh, being pretty simple. Uh, Taylor has ordered his troops to attack. They've moved up. Uh, they've fired some artillery, but uh, with minimal effect. One brigade on each side has been disordered. And that is all. So we'll come back with the uh, the union turn, the union maneuver phase. Okay, so it's the union turn. So it's worth noting at this point here that it's uh, still the 4 p.m. turn because a turn in Fire and Fury consists of um, both sides having their turn. So. Each player turn is like half a turn. So we've had the Confederate turn, and now we're up to the Union turn. Okay, and looking at the Union position, they've got two batteries on the hill. They're in a fairly strong position. They've only got experienced troops, whereas the Confederates have um, a couple of veteran brigades coming straight at them. So their main goal is to hold that hill and not uh, suffer too many losses. So they've got a couple of fresh brigades coming up behind, one disordered brigade in front here. So I'll have to have a look at it and think about what I would do in the Union position. Okay, so looking at their position at the moment, in another game system or something, you might, uh, if it's the Union turn, you might come off the hill and do your shooting and so on. Well, that's one of the good things about Fire and Fury is that if the Union decide to come off the hill, um, to push the Confederates back, well, they're going to be leaving their, their stronger position. That's one thing. But also, defensive fire. If they do move up into musketry range to try and, you know, put some hurt onto the Confederates advancing, they're going to cop the defensive fire before they get to shoot themselves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and uh, get these couple of batteries that are coming down the road here. I'm going to try and get these guys up and deployed, unlimbered. I've got a couple of brigades here. I'm going to try and just swing them around, maybe to the left flank. I think the right flank here is pretty solid. And they've only got skirmishing like uh, cavalry there with one battery. But the left flank seems a bit weak. So maybe try and swing these guys around. You have to plan ahead. Each turn is 15 minutes. And it's going to take a while for these guys to get around to that flank to protect it. Meanwhile, the Confederates will advance. So you have to think two or three turns ahead about where you want your guys to be. There's no like picking units up and moving them three moves across the table to plug a gap. You have to think about where they're going to, where you're going to need those troops later in the battle. Anyway, maybe I'm overthinking it, but that's what I'm going to try and do for the Union. 
Roll well, play considering the situation the union is in, and I think uh, I will send this unit to the left. So we're going to perform a march by the flank maneuver. They're going to hopefully get a uh, good result and move into the woods there. So uh, that is Dudley's brigade. They're dismounted cavalry. And uh, where's Dudley? Uh, where's Lee? Sorry, where's Lee? Their commander is over here. So he's definitely within 12. Um, and they've got the uh, core commander as well, um, which is Franklin. Franklin's in range as well. So they're getting plenty of pluses and they are an experienced unit. So three, fresh, five, couple of commanders, six. They get a well handled result. And so they'll march by the flank. And so I think they can move half. So normally they'd be able to move 12, but they're going to be moving into the woods, which would be a movement rate. Let me check. Broken ground, a move of eight. So they can move four inches if they go into the woods. So yeah, so it'll be... They're just going to march by the flank to in this direction. Staying on the hill. Their horse handlers will trot along behind them. And you're going to make some room for these brigades to move up behind them. So I'm just going to manoeuvre this uh, gun, which is going to come up and uh, unlimber next to them. So they would have moved and unlimbered. So they're going to full move and unlimber. Um, and they've got a commander in range and so on. So basically this artillery is just going to move up and unlimber and attach to them i guess and this gun's left unattached i'm going to move this gun up the road as well so this gun while there's a gap it's going to move up up the road and it will unlimber in that position so a couple of detached brigades they're going to be in the way a bit but uh, hopefully for the union's sake they will be able to a bit of hurt on the confederates as they come up the hill so i think that side's looking a bit stronger now then we have uh well we started the time didn't attach any but any commanders so it wasn't just leaving them all detached so i'm going to maneuver uh Raynor's brigade here he's under the command of cameron uh cameron's here and they've got a divisional commander as well they're experienced three they're going to be maneuvering no problem as well so I'm just going to wheel them around, and I'll get the template, and so I don't cheat and wheel more than 45 degrees. So I've got the wheeling template there, and they are experienced, they're fresh, they've got a couple of commanders there, detached and so on. Um, it's Raynor's Brigade, and yeah, seven, so they are uh, well handled, they'll be able to do a manoeuvre, so... If they wheel around, that'll be four inches, so four inches to there, and then they can, oh, I wheel quite so much, but I'm just going to move them up into that position there, just displace some of the commanders out of the way, they were underneath the template there, so they've moved up into that position, so they're done. Um, Glory's Brigade behind them, well, I think I might send those guys around to the left i think the right is in good hands as i said so they're going to wheel around as well uh three well handled with the bonuses and so on and so i'm going to wheel them 45 and then just move them up onto the hill here plenty of movement so i said i was going to try and be on the defensive but i can see an opportunity here on this right flank so I think uh, it was Lucas's dismounted cavalry here again to move up through the woods here. I think that's the plan. They might put some pressure on this right flank and uh, from the Conf Union right flank and push around here, try and straighten up our lines a bit and put some pressure on those uh, dismounted cavalry in the woods there. So Lucas's brigade will um, try and manoeuvre them. They've got, uh, they're in command, Lee is in command, they've got, uh, and Lee and Franklin are here, so they've got plus two for their commanders, they're fresh, so that's four, uh, so they're 
they're getting plenty of pluses or oh, they've rolled a 10 so they can move at the double quick with a maneuver along the way Steve, if they wanted to i'm going to just get them up into uh rifle carbine range so they've moved five the n and a little bit more and get them up into range why not that's an aggressive move don't want to mask our artillery or anything the little horse handlers will trot along behind them i suppose that's them uh langdrum's brigade i think they will Mm, they'll just wheel around a bit, I think. See what we get for them. Plenty of pluses with commanders and so on, so they can wheel around a little bit as well. So I'm just going to move them up and wheel a little bit. Yeah, up there as well. All right, and I think that's about it. The guys in the middle are all going to stay put, and then uh, at the end of the movement phase, I'll move the commanders. So. Keep Lee here so he keeps everybody in command. Lee and Franklin will hang around together. Ransom will stay up on the hill. He's an exceptional commander. Should have been adding more. Cameron will move up as well. So all the commanders are on the hill. All the artillery is deployed. Uh, so just have to remember which ones have moved and unlimited, which is these guys here. I have to remember that. The ones with the smoke will be able to fire. That's a good way to remember things as well. Okay, and I almost forgot about uh, Emerson's Brigade. Is it Emerson? I'll just check. Yeah, Emerson's Brigade, uh, who got disordered from all the uh, Confederate offensive fire. So they've got a disorder marker on them. And that's the unit uh, brigade here that is in uh, refused flank. So they still have to roll on the manoeuvre table and they are disordered. So they get a chance to rally. And so let's have a look at the pluses and minuses for them uh, on the manoeuvre table. So they've got um, plenty of pluses because they've got a commander um, and he's exceptional. So Ransom is an exceptional uh, core commander. So he's given a plus two, plus they've got their own divisional commander. So they're plus three. Um, they're fresh, so they're plus five. Their experience not going to help them there um so they're getting a plus five and there's no minuses for it being disordered it's going to be rolling for on the disordered effect so we'll roll a dice for them and we'll see what they get plus five so they've got a nine so rally good rally return to good order may move a half move right or deploy from column or dismount a cavalry so they have rallied so they can, can remove that uh, disorder mark. So almost forgot about them because I was going to be leaving them in position. So that disorder marker is removed. So they're okay. So they're okay again, ready for the. Uh... Okay, so defensive fire. I think um, I might have a musket shot over there from the. Um... Major's dismounted cavalry. We'll find out in a minute. I'll measure the arc. Maybe not. But I've still got these guns and the range hasn't changed. So I'll just add up those fire points again for you. So we've got um, this smooth bore. The smooth bore at uh, 18 inches uh, is going to give us a three, I think. And then these long range uh, rifle or smooth bore uh, cannons give us two each. So that's three plus another four for each one of those. Um, so that puts us on seven. And this Napoleon gun within 18 gives us a four. So we're on 11 fire points again. So we'll have a look at the shooting table. Shooting. There we go. So 11 fire points. 11 fire points gives them a plus one. Um, no other bonuses there. So a plus one to shoot at... Uh, I think it's Emerson's brigade up on the hill there. So plus one, got a three, four. They are a experienced unit. So a four lively fire. They're disordered again. Well, still no casualties, but they they are disordered again. They're holding in bravely there. 
Okay, so here's the uh, dismounted cavalry here, which is Major's Brigade, and he does have the um, the Union, those guys that moved up on their flank in arc, and this one's shooting through less than two inches of uh, woods, but I think the next stand is can, can see them, but uh, the visibility is blocked through the woods, so in the center of the stand there, I don't think it's two inches, so I've got one stand. So that would be one fire point at right table here. Uh, one fire point is minus four. So we'll, we'll throw a dice and see what happens. Well, a six becomes a two. Yeah, it's not going to do anything. Not worth shooting there. Uh, so I think that will conclude the uh, defensive fire. Okay, so offensive fire, I'm just checking the arc and range of that gun, whether it will be able to shoot at these dismounted cavalry in the woods, which is probably a bit of a waste because it's minus two to hit them. And it, they are in arc. We could add a couple of fire points from these um, muskets here, but the minus two in the woods isn't going to help. So if I look at these, this musketry here, I've got one, two, three, all those stands are in arc, but there's only a couple of them that can see them through the two inches of woods. So three stands there, plus the artillery. And I'll concentrate fire on the unit in the woods, even though it's a minus two for dismounted cavalry in the woods. So we'll check the fire points and roll a dice and see if they can do anything. But probably not, I'd say. So we've got, uh, it's a rifled and Napoleon within 18 inches. So it's in this chart here. So they're getting four plus the three from the uh, dismounted cavalry. So that's seven fire points. Gets us up to no negatives there. But dismounted cavalry in cover. I just checked the book. It is minus two. They count as in full cover. So we'll roll the dice anyway. Minus two. Two minus two is nothing. So nothing happens there. So there's cavalry dodged a bullet there. Then if we go back and look at uh, what is the view here, let's have a look. We've got one more gun here. The other two guns can't shoot because they moved and unlimbered. So these two guns can't shoot. But this one here can shoot across the uh, the orchard again at uh, Walls Brigade, and what type of gun is that again? Uh, it's a Napoleon within 18 inches. So we'll go to the to the shooting tables again. So a Napoleon, Napoleon at 18 inches will give us a plus four. So that is a minus one on the table. Um, we'll still roll. Here's another nice one. They got a nine. So a minus one becomes an eight. Oh, wow, they've rolled well there. So versus a veteran unit or an experienced unit. Experienced unit. All right, so it becomes an eight versus an experienced unit. Well, they would charge home, but it is telling fire. Disordered and lose a stand. So these guys... They were disordered from the uh, defensive fire last time, so they're already disordered. What happens then? Anything anything happened? Lose one troop stand or battery comes damaged. Brigade disordered and lose one stand. There's nothing else happens to them if they're already disordered. Sometimes they'll only lose a stand, so they'll stay disordered. I'll leave that there at the front to remind me. And they've lost a stand, so we've got our first, first casualty. Right, so the Union... Uh, offensive fire has done something and that is the end of the um, shooting phase from the bayonet and when you charge you like furies okay well it's a coffee break now so if you've made it this far thanks for watching um, so let's turn one there's no charge combat we haven't made it into contact yet but the uh, confederates have uh, Push their attack so they are advancing following their orders to advance and attack the hill 
And meanwhile, the Confederates are holding the hill. They've deployed their artillery on the hill. Uh, this unit of dismounted cavalry has moved up to put a threat, threaten the, the advance of the Confederates here. So um, I'll probably post this video now. This is turn one. It's taken a bit of time because I've been you know, recording and made a few mistakes and re-recorded a few bits and pieces. Uh, some honest uh, mistakes there. But um, let me know in the comments below if I have stuffed up anything. If you've got any questions about uh, anything that I've done, if you want anything you would like to see in the future, let me know. Um, so I'll post this up now and then I'll get on with the rest of the battle and um, fight it to a conclusion and we'll see what happens. So uh, thanks for following uh, the channel and subscribing and so on. Um, we're back after a long break due to illness, so hopefully I'll be able to keep recording some battles for you in the future. Um, so thanks. Uh, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time. Bye for now.